Good morning and welcome to our church online service. Today we're celebrating God's goodness as it's harvest time and those who are meeting in the church building are bringing supplies for our local food bank. We'll also be remembering that there are places in the world where life is very hard as we learn more about the work of BMS in Chad. Before that though, a psalm, one that mentions harvest. This is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest and God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. And now a video which you've probably seen before if you've been watching these online services for a while, but it reminds us that God's creation is good and it was a special request for today. And then after that we're going to watch a video about a more challenging part of the world as we look at the work of BMS in Chad. There is 
there's no God when all around creation calls a singing bird, a mighty tree, the vast expanse of open sea. Well, I'm, I'm praying up every day that God will protect us. I pray that God will protect our team. So taking precautions, but praying a lot so that God will prevent us from being caught in uh, COVID. The heat is there and the fear of coronavirus is there. There is a lot of stress. How are you, are you tired? Well, <laughs> I'm still carrying on. Um, it's fine. That's my normal life. I feel like it's a privilege to take care of people and make sure that um, they're healthy. I'm so happy to do that every day, even though uh, in the evening I'm exhausted. But I, I will say, though, thank you because you have granted me um, the privilege. So restore me and I will be able to do it tomorrow again. So I've seen God really moving because people come to the hospital desperate and they move out of the hospital full of joy. So I, I'm so happy to do that. Um, I'm committed to do more.
It was raining, and the van I was driving skidded and flipped over. I was terrified. I lost consciousness for an hour. I couldn't see anything. I lost the ability to do anything. A doctor in Cameroon wanted to amputate my leg. I spent five months with traditional healers. I suffered terribly. My boss told me that he'd been in a similar accident. But when he went to Guinnambour II Hospital, he got better. That's why he brought me here. My leg is starting to heal. The doctors here are really looking after me. I think that by the grace of God, everything is going to be okay. For those who have no idea about Chad and about Guinea Hospital, um, Chad is a country where um, most of the people don't earn much to survive and, and they need care. So the most that most people come here because they know that they, have, they don't have much, but they will, we're gonna care for them. I, I would say to anyone who is hearing this message, you can make a difference in many lives. My boy is alive thanks to this hospital. Coming here has strengthened my faith. I'm so happy. I trusted the midwives. I knew I'd have a good birth. If my family, my friend, my brother fell ill, I'd call Kabasu. You can save a life. You can bring someone to Jesus. That's for eternal life. So there is a lot to give. Today, I can give malaria treatments to patients who come to us. Today, I can diagnose over 30 patients. Will you help me? Today, I can give the right medicine to the people who desperately need it. Will you help me? Today, as a doctor, I'm pleased to heal people that come to this hospital. Today, as a midwife, I can help 10 mothers give birth. Today, I can help ensure that we give quality care to all of our patients. Today, I can pray with patients in the operating theatre. Will you help me? We have Jesus to give to people, but we have skills to give good quality care. It costs just £13 to ensure each patient receives the quality care they need. For £13 you could help us save a life. And if you could give more, £80 can provide a nurse to take care of critically ill patients for a whole week. And could your fellowship come together to raise £695? That would mean 52 patients being cared for, four life-saving surgeries and five babies making it safely into the world. We deliver babies, we remove cancers, we stitch up gunshots. We identify coronavirus symptoms and get sufferers the help they need. We bind up wounds and perform surgery. We pray for the broken hearted. We show poor people a Christian welcome and we see them come to faith in Jesus. We do all of this every day. We do it through the heat and the long hours and the tears. We do it through the fear of Boko Haram. We do it because people here need us and because Jesus commands it. We do it thanks to you. I'm proud of the hospital because the hospital is really making a big difference. Before we move on to our Bible reading, we're going to pray for the work in Chad while it's still fresh in our minds with another video. Let's pray. A prayer of dedication for Guinnabor II Hospital, based on 1 Kings 8. Father God, there is no one like you in heaven or on earth. You keep your covenant with your people and show them your love. The heavens cannot contain you much less those places created by humankind. And yet your spirit dwells in this place. Please listen to the prayers of your servants and our pleas for mercy, Lord our God. May your eyes be open towards this place night and day, this place of which you said, my name shall be there. Hear us when we pray for this place and for all the people in it. 
Hear us, O Lord, when we pray for this place. For those who are sick and suffering, please have mercy on them. May your healing spirit flow through this hospital, healing those touched by disease, affected by life-changing accidents or caught in conflicts. Hear our prayer from heaven, your dwelling place. Hear us, O Lord, when we pray for this place for those who have travelled across borders to receive the care they desperately need. May your presence ground those whose lives have been uprooted and may you make yourself known to those who don't yet know you. Hear our prayer from heaven, your dwelling place. Hear us, O Lord, when we pray for this place, for those who have dedicated their lives to serving in this hospital. Give strength to the doctors, nurses, midwives, porters, and all the other crucial workers who are saving lives every day. May everything they do be done in your name and in a way that glorifies you. Hear our prayer from heaven, your dwelling place. Praise be to the Lord, who has given rest and healing to his people. May the Lord our God be with us always. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him, to walk in obedience with him. And may these words, which we have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold all those who work and stay at this hospital according to each day's need. Let all those in this place know that the Lord is God and that he dwells among them. Amen. Amen. Our Bible reading today comes from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is part of the last sermon that Moses spoke to the Israelites before they entered the Promised Land. Moses knew that he wasn't going to be going with them, that he was about to die. So this is his last will and testament, all his hopes and dreams and fears for the people that he's led for 40 years. And these are some verses from chapter 8. Moses said, Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. And when you've eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something that your ancestors had never known to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. Some of you know that I had a new kitchen fitted a couple of months ago. And as I look at it now, it reminds me that when something is brand new, kitchen, car, clothes, our instinct is to want to keep it perfect. So for at least a couple of weeks, every surface in my kitchen was clear and polished. The washing up was always put away in the cupboard straight away. The floor was free of dirt. But gradually, as familiarity takes over, the standards tend to slip. Or mine do, maybe you're better at this than I am. 
And yes, my kitchen is still lovely and I enjoy it every time I walk into it, but now it looks lived in. There are crumbs under the toaster, the occasional cat footprint on the floor. I've begun to take it for granted, and so maybe not to care for it as diligently as I did at first. Today we're remembering that God has given us a world to live in that is good, and that we should never take it for granted. The video we started today's service with reminds us of that. Creation is good, God-given. We live on a beautiful, amazing planet. And we know that on this planet there should be enough resources for everybody. But we also know that that's not how our world currently works. And that's why in church this Sunday we've been collecting for food banks. There are many people in the UK, even around living near us, who struggle to feed their families. But compared to much of the world, we are well off. We have the NHS, whatever your particular experiences have been there, positive or negative. And there is a safety net for the most vulnerable. But we know that the world is full of inequalities in healthcare and other provision. And that's why BMS supports hospitals in many parts of the world. But why is this a particularly Christian thing to do? Surely as part of the human race, it should come naturally to us all. Or should it? If we're just part of the animal kingdom, no different really from a lion or a cat, then why is it that men and women have a sense of right and wrong? When a lion kills a gazelle or my cat brings me yet another live mouse and releases it into my living room, we don't expect them to think of their actions as good or bad, to make a moral judgment as to whether the mouse should have been left to go about its business unhindered or not. The lion and the cat act out of instinct. We may decide whether it was good for us, but that's a human response. The Bible has an answer that explains it, that men and women are fundamentally different from the rest of creation, although we are very much part of creation. Because fundamentally we are made in the image of God, made to reflect him to the world and made to reflect the world back to him. Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27, familiar words say this. God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Being made in the image of God means that every human being has incredible value because they are in some way like God, the creator, created, reflecting the creator. This value is not something we earn. It's not a capacity we can lose. It's given to the rich and to the poor, to the healthy and to the sick. It's a gift from God. Paul wrote to the Romans, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. This wonderful truth that we are made in the image of God is something to marvel at and be thankful for. Something that compelled David, the psalmist and then the king, to sing, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them? That you've made them a little lower than the angels and have crowned them with glory and honour. That's Psalm 8 verses 3 to 5. It's clear from the creation account and from David's psalm that as image bearers we are loved and cared for by God. This is despite our image having been tainted physically, spiritually, after sin came into the world. We see sin's effects all around us in broken relationships, broken and sick bodies. And Paul went on to say about the people around him, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator 
who is forever praised. But into this brokenness came the event that is the core of our Christian faith. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus into the world. He lived without sin among people like us. He died on the cross in our place and he rose again to bring us back into relationship with God. In his ministry, Jesus gave hope to those with broken bodies by healing the sick. But he also used this to point to a healing from an even greater sickness. He said to a paralysed man, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat and go home. And he did. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. It wasn't the healing of his body that caused such consternation amongst the onlookers. It was the fact that Jesus said that he could forgive sins. And it was in Jesus' resurrection that we most clearly see the value of forgiver of humans, that we are forgiven. Uh, the value of humans, including the physical human body, as being made as part of the image of God. We saw in Genesis that God looked at his creation, of which mankind is the pinnacle, and saw that it was very good. We don't, as Christians, subscribe to the idea that spiritual is good and physical is bad. God made us with bodies and he came to earth in a body with flesh and blood just like ours, one that could be hurt and could be killed. But Jesus, by his resurrection, proved that there is more to life than just the physical. We are body, mind and spirit. That's why the workers at the guinea Bore 2 Hospital in Chad and in places throughout the world, including the UK, are so passionate about their care for the physical psychological and ultimately spiritual needs of their parents, of their patients. We are body, mind and spirit. The doctor in our video said, we deliver babies, we remove cancers, we stitch up gunsh gunshots, we bind up wounds and perform surgeries. We pray for the brokenhearted. We show poor people a Christian welcome. We see them come to faith in Jesus. We do all this every day, we do it through the heat and the long hours and the tears. We do it because people here need us and because Jesus commands it. So how should we live here in the UK with all that we have been given? Well, if we turn back to our passage from Deuteronomy that we read just now, that gives us three strategies for how we should live. Firstly, in verse 6, observe the commands of the Lord your God walking in obedience to him and revering him. Let me read that again. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. We've read over the past few weeks the accounts of the early church trying to work out how they could stay true to the commands of God in their new circumstances and realising that it was not so much about the letter of the law as the meaning behind it that they should live a life that was pleasing to God in every way, loving, serving, praying, helping, giving generously to others, being those living sacrifices that God requires in every way that they were able to do so. And we are called to do the same, holding lightly to the possessions we have, caring for those in need, being cheerful givers, remembering that Jesus said in Matthew 22, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Secondly, our passage goes on. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. All good things come from God. That old harvest hymn says... We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. God is worthy to be praised. It's good to speak out our thanks as often as possible, both to God and to others. Let's try and be intentional about the growing, growing a habit of thankfulness. 
people who are thankful, who make thankfulness a habit, tend to be happier people who enjoy their lives more. They are the glass full, half full people rather than the glass half empty ones. And the other side of thankfulness is to show our gratitude by making sure that others also enjoy the fruits of prosperity. That's why we give to Food Bank or to BMS or to the many other organisations that we personally support. Paul wrote to the Corinthians as he organised a collection for Christians who were in need there. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much. The one who gathered little did not have too little. And thirdly, in our passage from Deuteronomy, verse 18 says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. That goes back to my first comment about not taking things for granted, whether it's a new kitchen or, far more importantly, what Jesus has done for us. We are living in that time of the new covenant between God and mankind. God has made promises throughout his history and his, with his people. And at the meal we know as the Last Supper, Paul tells us, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, and when he'd given thanks, took bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, how do we live as God has called us to do? We obey, we praise, and we remember. And we do all these things until he comes. Because there will become a time when all the troubles that we see around us will be put right. When there will be no more famine and crying and sickness. We believe, we know that Jesus will return again. And as Paul wrote, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying which is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? We have hope for the future. And in a moment, we're going to finish with a song about the hope that we have, that all will be put right, the song Living Hope. But before that, let's pray again together and we'll say the Lord's Prayer and the grace together. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God bless you. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ My living hope Who could he
The pearl.